podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Okay. Well, thank you very much um, to the organizers for inviting me. I'm actually from Venezuela, but uh, that's okay. <laughs> so today I'm going to be talking about gravity in twister space. This is work based. Uh, this talk is going to be based on these two papers, and I hope that, that by now you have had enough introduction of scattering amplitudes, and I don't have to motivate uh, why it would be interesting to reproduce many of the things we have learned in the past few years for young mills in the context of gravity. So let me start by reviewing what we learned uh, for young mills until 2005, and the reason I'll stop in 2005 will become clear in the next slide. So first of all, um, the first miracle that happened was that a large set of amplitudes whose Feynman diagram expansion is very complicated ends up miraculously being written in a very compact form, and this was discovered by Park and Taylor and written in fully supersymmetric form by Nair in the, in the 90s. So this is a very, very simple and beautiful formula for an infinite class of amplitudes. Now, in 2003, Witten introduced twister string theory that allows you to basically take this formula and boost it to any of the other sectors. In 2004, we discover a way of diagrammatically expanding in these very simple amplitudes, any amplitude that you want. In 2003 and 2004, Witten, Roybank, Spratling, and Bolovich in different works, uh, while here I'm referring to the original twister string theory paper, really, um, develop what is called, what is now called as the connected formulation, which is what I was referring to when I was saying that this formula can be boosted to any uh, r charge sector. In 2004 and 2005, uh, the BCF recursion relations, or more generally the BCFW construction was developed. Okay? So many more, many more things started to happen since 2005, but as I said, the reason I'm not going to review them is that for n equals a supergravity, much less is known. First of all, we had to wait until 2012, just recently, to get the part taylor formula, or the analog of the part taylor formula. This is work done by Hodges, where the MHB amplitudes, all MHB amplitudes are condensed in this simple looking formula, where the simple factor that you saw in Young Mills is now replaced by a determinant. The prime means that this is, a, this is a determinant of a matrix, of an n by n matrix that has rank n minus 3. So you have to define a pseudo determinant to make sense out of it. So the natural questions are, is there a string, is there a twist or a string theory? We don't know the answer of that. Is there an MHB diagram expansion, like the CSW expansion? We don't know the answer to that. The closest construction only works up to 12 particles. Is there a connected formulation for gravity? Well, a bit of good news is that there is BCFW recursion relations for gravity, which were proven in 2007 and 2008. Now, the purpose of this talk is to fill one of these gaps, and in fact, the purpose of the talk is to present two connected formulations for gravity that were discovered recently um, this year. So let's start with a connected formulation in N equals 4 super -Jamians. I'll start reviewing this because none of the talks previously uh, addressed the connected formulation in N equals 4 super -Jamians. So what are the ingredients? The ingredients are the following. You need a super twister space, which is nothing but CP3 slash 4. In other words, you have four bosonic components and four fermionic components the four bosonic components are treated projectively, and that's why you have a CP3. Now, you need holomorphic maps of degree D, and here I'm introducing K, which is the same K that you have been hearing all about this afternoon, but I'll explain it later on in the next slides. So these are holomorphic maps of degree D from CP1 to CP3 slash 4, and here are precisely the maps. Later on, we will be integrating over the model space of these maps, meaning I'll be integrating over the super twisters, which are the coefficients of these maps. These are the homogeneous coordinates on the CP1. Okay? We also need momentum eigenstate wave functions. We're going to be constructing amplitudes in twister, in twister space, 
but in order to interpret them in momentum space, we have to address them with momentum eigenstate wave functions that set some particular value for the lambda and the lambda tilde and the supersymmetric partner of each of the particles. Next, in Young Mills, we have color ordering, which you have heard about. So each particle comes with a lambda, lambda tilde, a supersymmetric partner, eta tilde, and a color index. So we can decompose any complete Young Mills amplitude in the sum of what are called partial amplitudes. Here, the partial amplitudes are order, the particle order here matters, while in the complete amplitude it didn't matter, here we're decomposing them in such a way that we only compute them using Feynman diagrams that are color order. Now having all that, I can present to you or review the connected formulation. So the connected formulation for an amplitude of n gluons in the case sector is simply given by the integration over the modular space of all the maps from a Riemann sphere with n punctures dressed with a momentum eigenstate times this factor here. I hope you recognize this factor as the factor that was sitting there in the MHB amplitude. So this formula basically takes the MHB amplitude and boosts it to all the K sectors. What do I mean by the K sector? Well, if you rescale the Grassmann parameters by a factor t, the amplitude in the K sector scales by t to the 4k. For example, k is equal to 2 for the maximally helicity violating amplitudes. In other words, any amplitude can be decomposed in all the possible k sectors. So let me also review the connected formulation, but in a slightly different point of view. This is some close to, somehow close to my heart, which is the Grassmannian formulation. So here, what we start with, we start with a an integration over the Grassmannian of two planes in n dimensions. So here I'm thinking about these coordinates, as about these column vectors as being points in C2. They are not points on a Riemann sphere anymore, they are points on C2. But I don't want to think about them as columns, I want to think about them as rows. So I have two m vectors in n dimensions and they define a plane. So this matrix defines for me a plane. Of course, I'm thinking about modulo GL2 because changing the basis of the plane should be relevant. And I want to define, I want to boost this into a CK space using a very standard construction in algebraic geometry called the Veronese map. This is a map of degree D, once again, D is equal to K minus 1, and this is what it does to any of these columns. It maps a column in C2 to a column in CK. So we can do that to the whole matrix, and we define a map, a natural map from the Grassmannian of two planes into the Grassmannian of k planes, where each of the entries of this matrix are given by this form. Now, in terms of the Grassmannian formula, the connected prescription or the connected formulation is nothing but the integration over two planes, but these two planes are mapped through the Veronese map into GKN, and these GKN planes, or points in GKN, are K planes that are restricted to contain a particular two plane that contains external data and be in the complement of the lambda tilde plane. So the complement of the lambda tilde plane would be an M minus two plane and somehow be orthogonal to this super partner four plane. So that's the full content of the Young Mills amplitude in the K sector. Now, a simple counting shows that the number of delta functions completely localize this integral. So this is not really an integral. You just have to compute the delta functions and sum over all solutions. But how many solutions are there for a given choice of N and K? Well, if you don't know the answer, what you do as a physicist is to start gathering data. Well, here is experimental data. For N and K, here are the numbers. So while I describe this slide, I would like to encourage you to add up the numbers in each row and see if you can find a pattern, okay? Now, once you have experimental data, the next thing to do as a physicist is to find the best fit for the data. It turns out that the best fit for this data turn out to be the Eulerian numbers. 
The only thing that I'm going to use about the Eulerian numbers is precisely the property that I mentioned. There is something special that happens to them when you add up the numbers in a particular row. I hope you all figure it out. Now we move on to gravity. So we have described the connected prescription in Young Mills, and we would like to find something similar to that in gravity. What would be the natural first step to take? Well, find somewhere a connection between gravity and Young Mills, but that has a name. It's called the KLT relations that you have heard about. So originally formulating in string theory, the KLT relations can be translated into field theory. And KLT is, in simple terms, it's just a contour deformation argument that dissolves an integration over Z and Z bar into two copies of holomorphic integrals over a disk. And in field theory form, this looks very schematically like this, where you have two copies of Young Mills amplitude somehow convoluted with a core that depends on only Mandelstam variables. This is something that Carrasco described in very much detail. Of course, if these were full amplitudes, we would have two copies of momentum conservation delta functions, and this formula would not make any sense. That's why I have defined, I've been careful to define an amplitude, a strip of the momentum conservation in each case, and the KLT relation only, only relates amplitudes without momentum conservation. So curly A and curly M represent amplitudes that contain momentum conservation, and in the KLT relation, only the ones without momentum conservation enter. The natural question is then, can we use the connected formulation for each of the Young Mills amplitudes in order to get a formula for gravity? Here are some problems. I just mentioned one of them. One of the problems is that if we just go straightforwardly and use these formulas, we get two copies of momentum conservation delta functions instead of one. The next one is a puzzle with the R symmetry. Somehow, Young Mills only has SU4 as an R symmetry. You have two copies of them. So you get SU4 cross SU4, which is a subgroup of the SU8 R symmetry that supergravity is supposed to have. And the general mechanism responsible for the enhancement seems to be a complete mystery. A curious fa fact is that this is trivial. The enhancement is trivial for the MHV sector, but not so for any of the other sectors. Now, each Young Mills amplitude is written as a sum over several solutions. The total number of them are the Eulerian numbers. From now on, I'll be assuming that that's the correct answer. So, in other words, that our experiments that we did are actually true, that for valid for any n and k. This means that the gravity amplitude is the product of two sums of residues plus the sum over permutations. In other words, we will have many cross terms. And unless some sort of miracle happens, the best that we can hope for is a formula that uses two copies of the Grassmannian formula that mix in complicated ways. For example, for eight particles in the K equals four sector, one will have 66 times 66 residues producing more than 4,000 terms for each permutation that you have to sum. So that's clearly not gonna be an improvement now, the solution to this problem, in order to describe it, I have to give a little bit of a preliminary, but you have heard about this already. This is the development of KK, known as the KK BCJ basis, which implies that any Young Mills amplitude, any partial amplitude with any color ordering, with any particular ordering, can be written as a linear combination of a basis of amplitudes where I fix three labels, one, M minus one, and N in this case. And that means that for any KR charge sector, the number of independent amplitudes is M minus three factorial, instead of the M minus one factorial that you would have thought, coming from cyclicity, you get M minus three factorial terms. We will see the significance of this number if you haven't already figured it out. So let's construct, construct a vector that lives in C M minus three factorial, whose components are amplitudes order in some, lexico, in some way. You can choose a lexicographic way of ordering permutations. So this is a huge vector, and in each component, you're putting one amplitude, labeled by the corresponding permutation. That will allow us to define 
what I would like to call the KLT bilinear form. In other words, this means that gravity amplitudes are nothing but the inner product of two such vectors in gauge theory using a bilinear form. This bilinear form is an n-3 factorial times n-3 factorial non-degenerate symmetric matrix. And here is the miracle that we were hoping for. At the moment, it's a conjecture. We call it the orthogonality conjecture. So recall that any amplitude can be written as the sum over these many solutions. I'm abbreviating the Eulerian numbers by this, by in this form. So we have these many solutions, and I label each solution by the label I, okay? Now, let VI be the corresponding n minus three factorial vector constructed from these guys. So we can construct for each solution an n minus three factorial vector. And here is the first form of the conjecture. The first form of the conjecture tells us that in the same k sector, any two solutions corresponding to two vectors are orthogonal with respect to the KLT bilinear form. And the second form of the conjecture is that any two solutions in different k sectors are orthogonal. Well, evidence for the conjecture, it has been tested in all the cases where we have experimental data. Now, here is the observation I hope uh, you made, which is that the total number of vectors for fixed n is obtained by adding all the, the number of solutions for all k sectors. But the nice property of Eulerian numbers is that they add up to precisely n minus three factorial. This means that the set of all residues of the connected formula for fixed number of particles form a complete basis of C n minus three factorial, which is orthogonal with respect to the bilinear form. Somehow, Jan Mills knows that it wants to play nicely with something called KLT in a way that is still mysterious to us. What are the consequences of this orthogonality conjecture? Well, it's very trivial. The consequence is that all these mixed terms that I was telling you about will completely drop out. Only the diagonal terms when you do this product of two vectors will survive or the product of the two amplitudes. I'll remind you what the KLT formula looks like, and here you're supposed to substitute the sum over all the solutions, and here the sum over all the solutions, but the orthogonality conjecture tells you that they all cancel out unless they have the same index, and therefore this is a formula that you get. I'm explicitly taking out the supersymmetric part just in order to see this piece here. You see that since they have the same index, they correspond to the same solution. Before you had an i and j, if the orthogonality conjecture wasn't true, there would be a sum over i and j, but since the orthogonality conjecture is being assumed to be true, there is only a sum over i. And that means that we can nicely define an a-dimensional Grassmann vector and obtain a formula that is manifestly SU8 invariant. So we have seen that a natural consequence of the orthogonality conjecture is the enhancement of SU4 cross SU4 into SU8. But how about the integrand? The integrand is still a sum over permutations. This looks a little bit complicated, but remember in the twist or string formula, sorry, or in the connected formula, the integrand was, was this simple looking formula that is very reminiscent of the MHB amplitude in Young Mills. These Fs are polynomials in Mandelstam variables, which I've written here. Now, if these two things were related in any way, this object would actually look like an MHB amplitude, just like the connected prescription was doing in Young Mills. Well, on the support of delta functions, they are connected, they are related to each other. Therefore, the Mandelstam variables look like something like this, where XAB is now defined to be an object that contains the square brackets and the extra factor. This means that the integrand is actually an MHP-like object, just like the Witten RSV formula. But now you may ask a trivial question at this point, which is, if this is, you're supposed to use any MHP formula, which MHP formula would you like to use? Of course, you will use the, an the analog of the Park-Taylor formula, and that's Hodges formula. And here I'm going to describe it in more detail. The matrix phi 
is a matrix whose off-diagonal components are given by this simple uh, combination of square brackets and angular brackets, and the diagonal terms look slightly more complicated, but those of you familiar with soft factors in gravity would recognize these as soft factors. So the formula knows about soft limits already. This matrix has rank n minus 3, and this means that any minor obtained by removing three rows, say A, B, C, and any three columns, D, E, F, is non-zero, and I'll denote it by this. And it turns out that the right formula or the right definition of this pseudo determinant is nothing but this object over here. It's easy to show that this is completely permutation invariant in all the labels. In other words, you can choose any rows and any columns to remove. They could even be the same label. Using that, we get our first formulation for supergravity, our first connected formulation for supergravity. It's again in the Grassmannian formula, it's an integral over g to n of this integrand with the same constraints that we had before, manifestly SU8 invariant, and the matrix that we have to put in here is an off-shell generalization of the MHB amplitude, where the matrix is now defined in this form. You see that it's similar to Hodges' formula, but this is what comes about after using the reduction of the KLT integrand. This J is something that compensates for the weight because in this case, the super twister space is not calabi yau so there is something else that has to compensate for the weight, and this J happens to be also a pseudo-determinant of a matrix of this size, but that has rank 2n, minus, 2N plus k minus 4, and is defined in terms of the, Veron of the Veronese map. So what have we achieved at this point? Well, we have a compact formula for the whole three level S matrix of n equals a supergravity. It's very reminiscent of the Witten RSV formula in that it takes an off shell MHV amplitude and boosts it to any k sector. It's manifestly SU8 invariant, and using the properties of pseudo determinants, it's manifestly permutation invariant. Parity invariance and soft limits have been also checked recently. What else do we want from this formula? Well, we would ask, we would like to ask, can this be written nicely in twister space? At this point, I don't know the answer to this question, but instead of trying to send this formula into twister space, something that we could do is to find a new formulation, yet a second formulation that will play nicely with twister space. So the main observation is that BCFW recursion relations for n equals a supergravity in twister space tell us that conformal invariance is actually broken in a very controlled way. People usually say that n equals a supergravity being non-conformal will not look nice in twister space because twister space seems to be natural for conformal theories. But in fact, precisely that fact tells you that if you know how conformal invariance is broken, you can use it to your advantage. And that's what happens here. In the k minus 2 in the k sector, or in the n to the k minus 2 MHV sector, Conformal invariance has to be broken precisely by a polynomial of degree k minus 1 in these brackets and n minus k minus 1 in these brackets. But recall that our matrix that we had before was a matrix of, that produces a polynomial of degree n minus 3 in the Mandelstam variables. So it doesn't know anything about the splitting. So we have to find something else. So here is a proposal. Once again, define a super twister space. This time it's not super calabi -Yau. We need A supersymmetries. So it's a CP3 slash 8. Exactly the same as before, but now chi has eight components. Define a holomorphic map of degree D from CP1 to CP3 slash 8, exactly in the same way as we did before. Momentum I guess state wave functions. I hope you can spot the difference between Young Mills and gravity. There is only one difference in the formula. Okay, time's up. The difference is a three here. Okay, in Young Mills it was first power, and in gravity you need a, a cube. And here is a formulation. Okay, well, this doesn't mean anything unless I tell you what these matrices are, and that's what we're going to do next. So, this is the new formula. These matrices are very reminiscent of the Young Mills amplitudes, oh, sorry, of the Hodges formula. But in this case, the off-diagonal terms, these are again n by n matrices, the off-diagonal terms contain more reference objects in both cases. You might wonder, what do they do? 
And the reason they have more reference things is that now phi tilde doesn't have rank n minus 3 as before. It has a rank that depends on the k sector, as can be easily checked. It has rank n minus k minus 1, while phi has rank k minus 1. Remember, the rank is going to be the degree of the polynomials we are going to produce. So this is exactly right to do or to produce a conformal invariant breaking that we were expecting from gravity. So here is the definition of the pseudo determinants. It's the determinant of a reduced matrix where you remove as many rows and columns as you need to first get something that has non-zero determinant. And in the denominator, you put the van der Monde of the rows and columns that you remove. Well, in the case of phi, the same definition holds, but here it's slightly different because in the denominator, you have to put the van der Monde of the rows and columns that remain. And as I mentioned, these matrices do exactly what we needed to break conformal invariance in the way that was expected. Now, what do we know about this formulation? Well, parity invariance is quite pleasant to see because in this case, phi tilde and phi get exchanged. It has the correct soft limits, By now, we know we have a complete proof that it satisfies the BCFW recursion relations, and we also have a Grassmannian formulation. Now, there are some pressing questions at this point. Is there a connection to the leading singularities of n equals say supergravity? What are leading singularities? Well, these are concepts that come from generalized unitarity that were introduced in the 60s during the analytic metrics program and that we have learned that control the full perturbation theory of n equals 4 super young mills and hopefully in this case, this could open a window into the structure of the loop expansion. How much time do I have? Two or three minutes, okay, very good. So now I can describe the whole loop expansion of n equals say supergravity in two or three minutes. <laughs> no, instead, I'll give you an outline of the proof using BCFW. So there are four steps. The first step is to check these are recursion relations. So we know that supergravity satisfies the recursion relations. So if we check the seed, amp the first step is to check the seed amplitudes, which are three particle amplitudes in the k equals one and k equals two sector check that the object has a nice large Z behavior so that you can use a residue theorem to compute, uh, to produce the, the recursion relation. The presence of all physical poles that has to be detected, dictated by three-level unitarity and the absence of one physical poles. So in view of the time, let me skip the first step. That's an exercise for you to check the seed that it reproduces the correct seed amplitudes. And let's have a look at the large Z behavior. I'll remind you that the BCFW deformation is something that takes two particles and deforms them in this form. And the crucial observation is that the large Z dependence can be removed from the external data by a simple change of variables. Here I'm using inhomogeneous coordinates for the sigmas, for the world sheet coordinates. Well, if you allow me to call it the world sheet, or the CP1 where these points live. So this is a change of variables, and under that change of variables, the measure picks up an order one over z from the sigmas, from the dt integrals of one over z cubed. So the product of these two things go like one over z to the fourth. However, the matrix phi tilde picks up a z square, while the matrix phi doesn't pick up any factors, goes like a constant, and therefore the total behavior of gravity goes like one over z square, which is actually much better well, it's slightly it's better than what you actually need. And it's better than young mills. In young mills, you only get one over z. Finally, let me give you a glimpse of the proof of factorization. And the key point is that factorization is to think about factorization as a residue in a parameter S square defined as follows. If P is a channel that you want to explore, you want to write it as a null vector plus another null vector with a parameter S square. And you want to think about computing a residue in that parameter. In twister space, what you are supposed to show is that the integral has, an, has a simple pole whose residue is given by this factorization formula. In other words, in terms of curves, we must show that the new formula has a simple pole on the boundary of the modular space where the curve degenerates and the residue is given by this formula. 
So in order to do that, we need a local description of a one-dimensional space containing the nodal curve that we are expecting in the factorization channel. And this is a local description, much like Witten described today. And local coordinates on one patch can be described by X and Z, and on the other patch by Y and Z. And he, what happens to the, match, to the measure is something very interesting. The measure immediately splits into two copies of the measure times some factor that is not important at the moment, times this power of S, times a DS squared. So what we need is to work hard and compute what happens to the rest of the formula and show that it precisely produces something that turns this into one over S squared, a simple pole, and then show that the rest produces the factorized amplitude. Well, as you can guess, um, even that Matthias told me that I have zero minutes left, that's an exercise for you. And we can talk about future directions. So the first one, and perhaps more, most pressing, is to explore the Grassmannian formulation that we have obtained, and also Song He obtained the same Grassmannian formulation recently. Here. This is a glimpse of what the Grassmannian formulation looks like. I'm not going to try to explain it. Um, but we know that many of the interesting things we have seen in Young Mills have come from, from having this Grassmannian formulation. So we have it now for gravity, and it's time to explore it. Next is, well, could one write an all loop recursion relation just as we did for planar Young Mills? That's an interesting question. Are there any new symmetries in gravity that are not manifest in the Grassmannian, in the Lagrangian formulation that will be manifest in this formulation? Well, if they were manifest, we have already found them, but maybe slightly more manifest than uh, in the Lagrangian formulation. And finally, explore the use of something called the matrix three theorem that you learn when you take combinatorics 101. But since I didn't take it, I had to wait until some people show it. Um, this is something that relates these pseudo determinants to the sum over uh, spanning trees of some connected graph. And those connections also seem to be very promising. Thank you. Questions? So um, can you? Solve the world cheek description for gravity that you got here for this explicitly for the split helicity case, like we can in Yang Mills. No, I don't think so. I think it's too early to, to attempt. Well, it, it's not too early. It's, it's a good time to attempt uh, getting a world sheet description, uh, but uh, it doesn't seem it doesn't seem to be straightforward. Okay, and the second question is, you, you mentioned here on this slide that something about planar Yang mills. Now, are you contemplating some type of planar-like uh, Hartree-Fock approximation for gravity, or what? No, I mentioned planar Yang mills because it's the thing that we best understand in Yang mills. But in gravity, there is no notion of planarity, so we just have to go for it, and, and hopefully, um, the whole structure will be will be completely. Uh, sorted out in, in one go. There is a question. Uh, you're proposing CP3 slash 8 as the relevant space, and within twister strings, the fact that it was Calabia was a key fact. Now, this is not a Calabia. Wouldn't that cause trouble for you? Yes, indeed. And, 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 and perhaps uh, in the first formulation, in the, in the very first formulation that I presented today, you saw that there was something in the denominator. So, so perhaps that thing that is in the denominator, well, first of all, I know that that, that object that is in the denominator depends on the maps, and, and its job is to compensate for the extra weight coming from the slash, from the extra four fermionic variables. So perhaps there is a way of defining a Calabija, uh, a, a, a holomorphic form that is well-defined using some sort of, some sort of pole. Yeah, but, uh, I don't know at this point. But the answer is yes, it will cause trouble if we, if we don't find a solution to that. <laughs>